1. Molly Molly O'Neill adjusted in her seat and groaned softly as her back twinged in protest. School bus seats hadn't improved much since her high school days. If anything, they'd gotten worse. Behind her, the handful of teenagers she was in charge of for the day were becoming restless, but she couldn't bring herself to confront them. They were already in for a tough day. How much longer? She bent forward and put her hand on the back of the bus driver's seat. Colton shrugged his thick shoulders at her and pointed to the ugly red line on the sat-nav that indicated heavy traffic. Who knows, he replied, drumming his large fingers impatiently on the steering wheel. Could be an hour or more. Molly looked at her watch and sighed. It was unseasonably warm, and the musty smell of the school bus was making her feel a little carsick. She took a long sip from her flask of lukewarm coffee and wondered, not for the first time that day, why she, as an English teacher, had been roped into this. The school's annual scared straight trip was usually handled by their brash and bulky gym teacher, Mr. Jones. This year, however, the principal wanted to spread the wealth, and she was elected as chaperone. Now, here she was, stuck on the highway on the way to Fairfield Prison with five disgruntled teenagers. The only saving grace was that they weren't all bad kids. Flick, flick, flick. It was the unmistakable flick of a lighter. I stand corrected, she thought, and bit back a sigh. What if she pretended she hadn't heard it? What if she just hunkered down at the front of the bus stared out of the window at the slow-moving landscape and imagined the scrawny trees at the side of the highway were actually a vast and glorious forest that she could escape to, a place where she could hide herself away and not have to deal with any of this anymore. Flick, flick, flick. Molly placed her palm on the armrest and steadied herself as she stood up. Slipping her phone into her jeans pocket, she cast her eyes over each seat in turn until she came to the obvious culprit. Lucky. Hand it over. Lucky had been so busy staring at his phone that he didn't notice Molly standing over him until she spoke. The phone? He said, slipping his phone-free hand down into the space between his hip and the side of the bus. The lighter? Molly held out her hand and wriggled her fingers. Now, please, Lucky. For a moment, she thought that Lucky might protest, but he was only 14, younger than the others, and essentially a decent kid. So, after looking around to see whether the others were watching, he did as he was told. I wasn't going to do anything, he said, and I don't think you've got a right to take my personal property from me. Trying not to smile at the fake bravado, Molly folded her arms. Well, you haven't exactly got a good track record, have you? she said, even though she knew that she shouldn't really be getting into it with him. Rolling his eyes, Lucky leaned a gangly arm on the rim of the window and waved his hand at her. It was an accident, he said. How come no one believes me? From the back of the bus, Jenna, who had been in more fistfights than Molly cared to count, shouted, Because you're a pyro freak, that's why. Ignoring her, Molly put the lighter into her pocket and said, Whether it was an accident or not, you set fire to your uncle's barn. You're on this trip for a reason. Plus, you and I both know that if you're caught in possession of a lighter, you'll be in a whole world of trouble, especially if you're caught trying to take a lighter into a prison. So, consider me confiscating this a little taste of what it's like in jail. No luxuries, no control someone else deciding what you can and can't do. All right, Lucky whined. Can't we wait till we get there before starting the lectures? Molly opened her mouth to reply, but thought better of it. She'd been teaching long enough to know that the worst possible thing you could do was allow yourself to be sucked into an argument, especially if you were trapped in an airless bus on the longest school trip in history. She continued her walk down the bus aisle, now that she was up, she might as well check on the others. At the back, the Banks twins, Eric and Scarlett, leaned into the aisle, bickering with Jenna. Seriously? Molly thought. 
There's only five of them. How can they be this much hard work? Right, she said, positioning herself between the twins and Jenna. What's going on with you three? Nothing, Scarlet replied, narrowing her eyes at Jenna and sinking back into her seat to look at her phone. Yeah, Eric agreed. Nothing? Molly looked from Jenna to the twins, then shook her head. Okay, well, keep it down. Mr. King is trying to concentrate up there. She had turned and started to head back to her seat when she unmistakably heard Eric mutter loudly to his sister, No wonder she gets in so many fights. She's got arms like a freaking dude. Scarlet sniggered loudly. There was a millisecond of silence before Jenna yelled, Yeah? So what if I have? Molly spun around in time to see Jenna lunge for Eric. He scrabbled backwards, backwards, almost right into his sister's lap, but Molly dashed forward and planted herself in front of him. Placing her hands on Jenna's shoulders, she met her eyes. Jenna was breathing quickly. Her eyes were wide and furious, and her cheeks were flushed. It's not worth it, Molly said, willing Jenna to listen to her. Really, it's not. Jenna was trembling, but she'd been in too many fights. One more, and she'd be kicked out of school and sent straight to juvie. Jenna, it's not worth it, Molly repeated. Slowly, she saw Jenna's shoulders drop. Good, right. Now, why don't you go sit up front? Jenna nodded. Molly let out a long, slow breath as she watched her release her clenched fists, pick up her backpack, and move several seats away from Scarlet and Eric. Jenna could have easily taken Eric. He was mouthy when he was with his sister, but he was skinny too, and had never so much as thrown a punch as far as Molly knew. Thank God she'd managed to calm Jenna down and hadn't had to return the kids to their parents with black eyes and bloodied noses. Although, at least if she had, it might have assured she was never selected to chaperone a trip like this again in the future. Sitting down opposite the twins in the seat Jenna had just vacated, Molly leaned forward and put her hands on her knees. Come on, you two. You know better than to instigate anything. Out of everyone, I thought the two of you were the ones who probably didn't deserve to be here. Molly shrugged her shoulders. Maybe I was wrong. Scarlet buried herself in her phone and refused to look at her, but Eric looked sheepish and almost apologetic as he said, Yeah, whatever. Well, not whatever, Eric. Ahead, Colton swore under his breath, and Molly looked up. Standing up and stepping away from the twins, she saw that he was shaking his head and gesticulating at something out of the window. What the hell is this? he said loudly. Molly dipped her head and narrowed her eyes. Ahead, a couple of yards away, the road sign, which had, a few seconds ago, announced a detour due to a traffic accident, flickered. The orange lights flashed on and off and on again. Then they disappeared completely. Molly frowned. At the front of the bus, Lucky let out a clap of laughter. Jenna was sniggering too. What the... Colton turned to look at Molly, and she felt her cheeks begin to flush because the sign now read, Sheeple Make Good Venison. It was accompanied by a crude drawing of what she could only assume was supposed to depict cannibalism, and Molly knew exactly who was responsible. Scarlet? She whirled around and snatched the girl's phone from her hands. Hey! Scarlet and Eric yelled at the same time. Molly didn't give in. She put her hands on her hips and shook her head. You're on this trip because of exactly this kind of behavior. Scarlet opened her mouth to speak, but Molly interrupted her. And don't even bother trying to tell me it wasn't you. Change it back. She handed Scarlet her phone. Now. With the road sign back to normal, Jenna sitting in the middle section of the bus with her headphones on, and the others seemingly done with causing trouble, Molly returned to her seat. Without meaning to, she exhaled loudly as she sat down, and Colton turned to her. Don't know how you do it, 
he said, looking past her at the unruly concoction of students she'd been put in charge of. This lot. Every day. Molly attempted to smile, her temples ached with tiredness, and what she wanted to say was, I don't know either, and I don't know how long I can keep doing it for. But she didn't. You don't have it too easy yourself, she said, driving busloads of rowdy kids around all day. Colton shrugged at her. Nah, he said, smiling with the corner of his mouth. I'm just the driver. I don't have to keep them in line. Well, you might have more luck at it. Molly looked briefly at the tattoos on Colton's forearms and his short, sharp, military haircut. I'd say you do all right, he said, turning back to the road. Listen, we're almost at the detour. Should be at the prison in half an hour. Molly nodded. I'll call them. After speaking to the warden's assistant, Molly hung up, put her cell phone in her bag, and took out a battered copy of The Call of the Wild, an adventure novel she picked up at a flea market a few years ago and had devoured several times since. In the seats opposite her, Zack, the only student yet to cause her any problems, was also reading. Smiling a little, Molly peered around his book to look at the cover. She knew Zack, he was in one of her English classes, and she was pleasantly surprised to see him reading. In class, he was pretty much always silent. Clever, but silent. The kind of kid who gave off a serious, leave-me-alone vibe, and who no one ever wanted to get that close to. Good book? she asked, angling herself toward him. Slowly, Zack looked up at her from beneath his dark, greasy hair. He wore glasses, was extremely pale, and had piercingly blue eyes that were more than a little unnerving. Molly had known kids like him before, kids who leaned into the I'm a loner thing as a form of self-preservation. Closing the cover, he placed both hands on top of it. I've read it a couple of times myself, Molly said, gesturing to the book. In fact, it was one of her favorites. I love dystopian stuff. With a withering look, Zack pursed his lips. Psychopath! A couple of seats behind, Lucky rolled his eyes. I don't even feel safe being on the same bus as him, Miss O'Neill. Molly ignored Lucky, but Zack had already opened the book again and adjusted his glasses on the bridge of his nose. Sighing a little, Molly turned away. As she did, Zack said in a gruff teenage voice, and without looking at her, You know, the dystopian worlds in these books might be more interesting if we didn't see the exact same behavior in other people every single day. Facing away from her, he gestured to the window. Every time we step outside. Molly swallowed hard. She hated to even think it, but she saw where the other kids were coming from. Whether he meant to be or not, Zack was a little creepy. Although he did have a point, a lot of the time, for a lot of people, life wasn't all that kind. For years now, Molly had felt an increasing need, deep down in the pit of her stomach, to escape, to run away to a little piece of land somewhere, and to live totally and utterly by herself. Off-grid, no papers to grade, no kids to try and drag through high school so that they could have half a chance in the big bad world. What was that about? Colton asked, turning and lowering his voice. The psycho thing? Molly sighed and leaned in a little closer. Zack's got a bit of a reputation. His older brother Tommy killed someone. He's in prison. Last year, Zack was kicked out of military school for beating another kid unconscious. Colton sucked his cheeks in and shook his head. Turning back to the steering wheel, as traffic finally began to move again, he looked into the rearview mirror. But he wasn't looking at Molly. His eyes were fixed on Zack, and something flashed across his face that Molly hadn't seen before. Was it pity or understanding?